Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for being patient. Uh, we thought we would give other people a chance um, to join. I'm here representing the Glopadar Secretariat today, and I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Glopadar Clinical Trials Network. This is our uh, first public webinar, and we're delighted uh, that Professor Steve Webb will teach us today about adaptive clinical trials. We will put up a, a bio on the website for more detailed information regarding Steve. Uh, however, safe to say he is actually a representative of the regional uh, research network called the Prize, and a member of uh, the European regional network called Prepare, and also ISARIC. Thank you very much, and over to you, Steve. Thank you very much, uh, Gail. It's a um, quite warm and balmy evening uh, in Perth, in Australia. It's still about 28 uh, degrees uh, outside, but it's a great pleasure uh, to be able to um, uh, present this webinar. And before I start, I just want to acknowledge that there's a, a, a very large number of people who are associated uh, with this work, far too many uh, to name individually. But I do want to highlight the, the major intellectual contribution of Derek Angus, uh, an ICU specialist in Pittsburgh, and Scott Berry, uh, a statistician at Berry Consultants uh, uh, in, uh, in Texas. Um, so the talk will progress through, um, through five areas at, a, at different uh, speeds. I'll talk briefly about what are adaptive trials. I'll talk about some of the limitations that are associated with um, conventional fixed uh, non-adaptive trial designs. I'll then uh, uh, run through the features that are associated with a particular type of adaptive trial a particular type of adaptive platform trial called a randomised embedded multifactorial adaptive platform trial. That's quite a mouthful. A remap is how I'll refer to it uh, on an ongoing basis. And then I'll talk about some of the challenges associated with preparedness to conduct trials during a pandemic, and then run through some of the design features of remap CAP, which is a pre-planned, pre-approved and practised trial designed to be activated in the event of a pandemic um, of severe acute uh, respiratory illness. Uh, adaptive clinical trials are a particular type of clinical trial in which there's um, a range of different routes that the trial might take as it evolves over time in which the data that accrues during the trial determines the exact route which the trial follows. So it has inbuilt um, potentially an enormous amount of flexibility to adapt its design and its circumstances in a way that's most appropriate based on the results of the trial as it's accruing. What it isn't is an opportunity to change the design or make up uh, design features as the trial progresses, because all of the potential adaptations are specified or pre-specified at the time of tri trial launch and included within the initial protocol of the trial, and there is no capacity to deviate from what is specified in the protocol. So there's a lot of things which make you feel like this associated with conducting uh, clinical trials the way that they've been conducted, albeit very successfully, uh, for many decades. One of the aspects of clinical trials is that they really are extremely costly uh, and difficult to do. Um, a commercial trial um, being done for regulatory purposes can easily cost in the realms of several hundred million dollars. But even a large, successful investigator-initiated trial might well have a budget of many millions uh, of pounds or, uh, or US dollars. And one of the features which makes them costly and difficult is that there's a clinical silo which is quite separated from the research silo. And the separation of research activities from the clinical silo results in many aspects of trial design and conduct that are very labour intensive, even though if the trial was embedded with
within routine practice within the clinical silo, it, be, it could be conducted in a much easier and much less costly uh, manner. One other aspect of, uh, uh, of clinical trials, which is, a, in my opinion, a limitation of the way that conventional trials um, are designed, is that they actually often don't answer the questions that we need as clinicians or public health uh, uh, personnel uh, to, have, uh, to have answered. Part of that is that often trials just evaluate um, the average treatment effect um, in the average patient. But we know that patients uh, are all individuals and sometimes they respond differently to uh, interventions that are provided in clinical trials. In my own discipline of intensive care medicine, I'm certain that we've seen trials in which an intervention has benefited some participants but harmed other participants. And then within a single trial, the harm and the benefits cancel each other out and we see a trial that shows no difference in outcome and we're unable to identify the subgroup that have, uh, that have benefited and the treatment uh, is abandoned. A second limitation of many conventional trial designs is that they ask quite a narrow question, which is whether this particular treatment works and not what is the optimal treatment or the optimal combination of treatments for this particular disease. Another statistical aspect of conventional trial design is that it is often the case that trials don't use their available sample size particularly efficiently. And this is a consequence of the use of uh, frequentist statistical methods, which is the type of statistics which the vast majority of trials utilise, which require the sample size to be fixed and held constant uh, before the trial is initiated. But what that means is that one of two situations uh, can occur. It may be that um, the trial stops before there's actually sufficient statistical confidence uh, to answer the question that is being asked. It's also the case, and we've seen this before, that many trials um, stop with a very, very small p-value, meaning that there was substantial statistical confidence well before the sample size was uh, completed that the treatment was effective. And so perhaps what we need is something that would have been familiar to Goldilocks, which is sample size that are not too small, not too large, but just right. And another thing which is a limitation of the way that trials are conducted at the moment is that the actual participants within the trial don't have the opportunity to benefit from data that has already uh, accrued. So they are in many ways actually in reality guinea pigs. So even if a trial, if it was stopped at a certain point, would show that a treatment was uh, beneficial, continues to randomise patients with half the patients being randomised to an ineffective or harmful treatment. And that's a consequence of the requirement with frequentist statistics that a pre-specified sample size must be achieved before the final analysis can occur. And the last limitation that occurs with many types uh, of, but, well not with many types of trials, but with all types of trials, is that even after the results of the trial show that a particular treatment should be implemented into practice, that the results are frequently ignored and not uh, actually implemented. So platform trials are a, um, a genre of, of trials developed um, 
um, by uh, a group of uh, Bayesian uh, statisticians um, built around Berry Consultants who are based in Austin, uh, Texas. Um, this is a, um, a viewpoint article uh, published in JAMA about two years ago um, by Scott Berry uh, and colleagues, which outlines uh, the design features uh, of a platform trial. And the remap variant, the randomised embedded multifactorial adaptive platform trial, is a, a variant of platform trials um, promoted particularly by Derek Angus, which is designed much more to be embedded within healthcare systems and designed uh, to work particularly for comparative effectiveness questions and particularly at the level of phase three clinical trials where definitive answers are being sought to the question related to the effectiveness of particular interventions. So what is a platform trial? A platform trial is a system. So it, it's an ongoing process, a system that seeks to optimise the treatment of a particular disease as time goes by. It's comprehensive in its goals. It doesn't seek to answer a narrow question as to whether a treatment is effective, but it seeks to determine the optimal treatment or the optimal combination of treatments. And so it's designed to be a perpetual trial that continuously updates best treatment for all patients uh, within the platform. But it's a perpetual trial that is over when one of several circumstances, possible circumstances occur. One is that there are no new candidate treatments for the disease that haven't been evaluated. And another is when the disease has been solved and is no longer a public health problem. But otherwise, it would seek to continue to process in a systematic way the new treatments for a disease in combination with the best existing treatments to continuously update the best treatment for all patients in the platform. As I said, in traditional trials, a very important first step is to specify the sample size. And this is done by determining two things. The first is the plausible effect size of the intervention that is being evaluated. In reality, what usually happens in conjunction with planning a trial, which needs to be submitted to a grant funding agent, agency, is the plausible effect size is modified seriously by the available budget. Having determined a plausible effect size that's within budget, it's then multiplied by a selected type two error. And that slide will just serve to remind you of the difference between type one and type two uh, errors. And so what happens in the design of a traditional clinical trial is that multiple assumptions are made at the beginning of the trial. There's an assumption that the right patient population is being studied. There's an assumption that the best treatment options available have been chosen for the trial. There's an assumption that the right treatment effect has been estimated. And then to be allowed to validly analyse the trial using frequent statistics, it's actually necessary to define all of those key parameters and hold them constant during the entire execution of the trial, even if you know from the data that has accrued that um, some of those assumptions are not valid. In a conventional trial design, they just cannot be uh, revisited. And so what happens in a traditional trial is uh, you start to randomise and you're young and fit and enthusiastic and you continue to randomise and you continue to randomise and grow a little bit older and hopefully, before this happens, you get the opportunity to analyse the results having accrued the targeted sample size. And when the analysis occurs, there's one of two possible results. 
it might show difference. The magic p-value might be below 0.05. Or it might show no difference. But frequently, it's difficult to distinguish between there truly being no difference between the outcome of the two groups or whether the trial is indeterminate, either because the plausible effect size was overestimated and the trial was underpowered, or whether there might have been the subgroup effects that I talked about earlier with differential treatment effect with one group benefiting and another group being harmed and those two effects cancelling each other out. And additionally, the outcome of the trial may have been known long before the trial finished recruiting to its um, uh, planned sample size, either because the effect size was greater than estimated and unnecessary patients were randomised, or because there was no difference at all between groups and the trial continued long after there was futility to demonstrate the occurrence of equivalence. There are four key design features of a platform trial that seek to um, sometimes completely and other times partially overcome the limitations that I've been talking about with conventional trial design. The first is that the trials are analysed uh, using frequent interim analyses using Bayesian uh, statistics, which allow for the capacity to undertake frequent interim analyses. The second aspect is that it tests multiple interventions simultaneously. So it allows um, two, three, four, or if required, eight or ten different questions to be evaluated within the same patient within this uh, framework of a platform trial. The third feature is termed response adaptive randomization, and I'll explain that in more detail later. But in essence, what it is, is it's a way of allowing the participants later within a platform trial to benefit from the data that has already accrued to increase the likelihood that they're randomised to treatments that are more effective rather than less effective. And lastly, it allows in pre-specified subgroups the capacity to identify differential treatment effects so that if benefit is occurring in one group and there's no uh, effect or harm in another subgroup, those subgroup effects can be teased out as a design feature of the trial. So I'll go through each of those uh, in turn. Bayesian statistics have existed for um, uh, well over 150 years. They have a very solid ground um, in statistics, but until relatively recently, the computing power that has been necessary to utilise them to analyse more complicated data sets um, hasn't existed. What Bayesian statistics do you start with a prior probability, which uh, in the trials that we do starts as an uninformative prior, and it then asks the question, given the prior probability, which is then recalculated at each frequent interim analysis, what does the accumulated data since the last uh, interim analysis uh, do to change what's termed the posterior probability, which is essentially the probability that an intervention is superior, inferior or equivalent to one or more other interventions that are being uh, tested. So what happens within a platform trial is that there are frequent adaptive analyses. And at each adaptive analysis, if there is sufficient statistical confidence to say that there is now an answer to this question, then the question is terminated and the answer is um, uh, disseminated by publication and presentation. And the answer is, um, becomes available when sufficient data has accrued, not when a pre-specified sample size is achieved. 
And so the trial randomizes and analyzes, it randomizes and analyzes, and it randomizes and analyzes. And as a consequence, it means that as soon as statistical confidence is achieved, that question is answered. And when there's analysis, it can show difference or equivalence, but it avoids indeterminate results because if there is insufficient statistical confidence to conclude a question, it just continues to enrol until sufficient statistical confidence has been achieved. And so at each adaptive analysis, there's prior data, which provides a prior probability. There's new data, which is combined with the prior probability to determine a new posterior probability, for which there are four options. An intervention can be deemed superior, it can be deemed inferior, it can be deemed equivalent around a predetermined um, margin of equivalence, or there can be insufficient statistical confidence, in which case the trial just keeps enrolling and cycling through this process. So in explaining a platform trial, there's some nomenclature which is important uh, uh, to identify. I said previously that platform trials are multifactorial. And just to uh, unpack that a little bit further, it means that there's randomization to multiple components of treatment simultaneously in the same patient. So this describes the, uh, um, it's not the exact design of REMAP-CAP, uh, but it's close. There is um, options related to testing the um, uh, antibiotic or the primary antibiotic uh, of choice. In a remap cap enrolls patients with severe community acquired pneumonia. It randomizes them to whether or not there is a steroid uh, to be administered, hydrocortisone, whether if the antibiotic regime includes a macrolide, whether it's of short or long uh, duration. And for patients who have severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, it randomizes them to different aspects uh, of uh, ventilatory uh, support. And so that's randomization across multiple questions defines multifactorial. We use the term domain to define a category of treatments that have the same purpose with mutually exclusive options. So the alternatives of keftriaxone, Kipracil and Tazobactam, and moxifloxacin are all options within the domain of antibiotic treatment. An intervention is the treatment option within a domain, which can include a no treatment option. For example, here within the steroid domain, there's a no steroid uh, option. But a regimen is the actual individual combinations of interventions across all domains to which a patient actually receives their randomization allocation. And so I'll run through now what uh, could happen within REMAP-CAP. We haven't yet uh, started substantial recruitment, but this is designed to give you an idea of how that this perpetual trial evolves and adapts according to the data that has accrued as the trial progresses. So at launch, we're starting with four domains. Choice of antibiotic, whether or not to use hydrocortisone, the duration of the macrolide therapy, uh, the ventilation strategy in the subgroup of patients with severe hypoxemic respiratory failure, and we're also interested in the possibility of a domain related to the target oxygen saturation that um, uh, should be achieved for that particular patient. And so at launch, we could be, for example, comparing the three antibiotics within the antibiotic domain, steroid or no steroid, duration of macrolide therapy, the ventilation strategy. But at launch, there's insufficient statistical power to include the oxygenation saturation target uh, domain so that continues to be a choice that's available to the treating clinician. As the trial progresses and evolves, interventions that are shown to be 
um, uh, inferior are removed from the platform. So patients are no longer exposed to inferior interventions. And if an intervention is shown to be superior, it replaces all other interventions within that domain. So it could be that as the trial evolves, some years later, this is what it looks like. It so turned out that ceftriaxone turned out to be the best uh, antibiotic. And so now 100% of patients within the platform are being allocated to ceftriaxone. And we've managed to not just determine what's the best treatment, but for patients within the platform, we've actually implemented best treatment as well because it continues to be an allocation that is determined by the platform. If you recall, at launch, there was uh, in the steroid domain, the options of steroid or no steroid, it might be, and this is just one theoretical possibility, that steroids were beneficial, but there was doubt about whether or not a short or a long course of steroid was most beneficial. And so now all patients are receiving hydrocortisone, but they're being randomised to different durations of uh, treatment. In the macrolide domain, it turned out that long macrolide was most effective, and so that's now been implemented. And what's happened in the ventilation domain, in the purple domain, is that it's been determined that uh, six mils per kilo ventilation was inferior, and so it's been removed from the platform. But we're continuing to randomise between the two remaining options of APRV and extracorporeal CO2 removal. And because we've um, removed domains, the antibiotic domain and the macrolide uh, domain, we've now got the statistical space to be um, um, uh, randomising patients uh, to uh, um, either a low oxygen saturation target or a high sat oxygen saturation target. And so I hope uh, it can be seen how the trial evolves over time in a perpetual way depending on the results uh, as the trial um, has accrued patients. Another feature of platform trials um, is response adaptive randomization. But to explain traditional randomization first, in most trials there's just a fixed one-to-one -one randomization proportion. So as the trial progresses, an equal number of patients are randomised to the two different treatment interventions until the sample size is accrued. But some, in some trials, it might have been obvious by the halfway mark or the three-quarter way mark, or even earlier, that one intervention was much more effective than the other intervention. And so, to some extent, there's an issue uh, related to ethics of the appropriateness of having continued to randomise patients uh, when, if the trial had been analysed, would have shown that one treatment was superior. Response adaptive randomisation deals with this by varying the proportion of patients that are randomised to each intervention in proportion to the likelihood that each intervention is superior. So as the trial starts, there is a 50-50 randomisation to each group because it's not known which is best. But if over time the blue group starts to do better, then progressively more patients are randomised to that group. And the patients that are later in the trial actually benefit from the data that is accrued within the trial, even when the results haven't been analysed and made publicly available. And the last feature is the possibility of evaluating differential treatment uh, effects. So um, uh, in REMAP-CAP, uh, we um, have the capacity to have two strata. Um, here we've got an example of strata related to patients who have high levels uh, of oxygen versus patients who have um, some degree of severe um, hypoxemia. So in essence, we run two trials in parallel, one in the less uh, well-oxygenated patients and one in the better-oxygenated patients. 
if for a particular domain, here for the example of steroids, the direction of the treatment effect is congruent between those two strata, then each strata, although it's analysed separately, borrows information from the other strata to the extent that it's appropriate uh, to do so based on how congruent the treatment effects are. But if, for example, there are divergent treatment effects, then each strata is analysed separately and a separate conclusion is reached and presented and published um, related to the um, differential treatment effect of the intervention in that particular category of patients. And under many circumstances, we're also able to evaluate um, uh, um, second order treatment treatment interactions, determining, for example, whether or not a particular antibiotic is better contingent on whether or not a patient was randomised to steroids uh, or no steroids. And this is obviously something that can't occur in conventional treatment, in conventional trials in which there are only two interventions simultaneously and only becomes possible in trials that are uh, multifactorial. So Bayesian adaptive trials have been around for a while. Berry uh, have run more than 400 of them. Um, they use robust rules to control type 1 and type 2 error. They have been published in high impact uh, general medical journals. They've been accepted by the FDA and the EMA for regulatory purposes and they are the best way of most quickly giving the correct qualitative answer to a particular clinical question. So what does it mean for pandemics? Well, pandemics on, on average occur every uh, 23 years. Uh, it's been eight years uh, since uh, the last one. Um, the maximum gap that's ever occurred between pandemics uh, uh, has been 49 years. So the clock is ticking and it would seem highly likely that the influenza virus um, will mutate uh, at some point and result uh, in a new uh, pandemic. In many ways, the H1N1 outbreak that occurred in 2009 uh, was, a, was a catastrophic uh, research failure. It was a one-off opportunity uh, to undertake uh, time-critical research and the scope uh, of that harm uh, was, uh, was very uh, substantial. There were clinical trials that were funded uh, to recruit uh, patients during the 2009 uh, pandemic, um, funding for several thousand patients to be randomised. Uh, but John Marshall, who's a colleague based in Canada, um, it's his understanding that of those trials, perhaps um, a few tens of patients uh, were ever recruited into H1N1 specific clinical trials during the last pandemic. And the reason for that is that pandemics turn up uh, quickly uh, and unexpectedly. The incidence uh, peaked after four to five weeks and the prevalence or ICU bed occupancy remained elevated for 12 to 15 weeks and then fell away reasonably rapidly. And so this is a slide prepared by a colleague of mine based in Queensland, Peter Kruger. He proposed to do some work uh, during the pandemic related to the pharmacokinetics of oseltamivir. He commenced the ethics application uh, several weeks after the first patients uh, started uh, to appear in ICUs in Queensland. Uh, it only took him two weeks to do the ethics application, which is a pretty remarkable uh, effort. So he submitted it um, before the epidemic uh, had peaked and uh, he obtained approval quite rapidly, but after the last patients had been admitted uh, to the ICUs uh, in Queensland. When a pandemic turns up, it, it, there is simply not the available time um, to plan, let alone fund and have approved um, uh, anything other than very simple descriptive uh, observational studies which don't provide high quality information on the most effective treatments to manage patients. 
And yet it's very likely that focused clinical research that is able to be implemented at the beginning of an outbreak has a, an extraordinary opportunity to change the shape of the, uh, and the trajectory uh, of the pandemic curve as a consequence of identifying the most effective treatments um, to, uh, to save lives um, and to uh, control the illness um, as rapidly as possible. But I think there's now a strong consensus, and Glopidar has been at the forefront of this consensus, is that effective pandemic research must be shovel-ready. It must be capable of being switched on. And that's only possible if it's pre-planned, pre-approved, and practised. And so Remap Cap uh, is a large um, platform trial of, uh, that um, intends to enrol patients with severe community-acquired uh, pneumonia during the inter-pandemic period, answering questions of major importance to clinical medicine about the optimal management of inter-pandemic severe community-acquired pneumonia, but capable of being turned on and adapted to answer the questions that are most appropriate in the event uh, of a pandemic. And so the launch design of Remap Cap is that it comprises an antibiotic domain with uh, a range of uh, recognised conventional uh, um, antibiotic options, a macrolide duration domain, which is nested within the antibiotic domain for those patients who are randomised to a beta-lactam beta plus a macrolide, with the intention of the macrolide duration domain being to determine whether or not the putative immune modulatory properties of macrolide have a beneficial effect on the course of severe community acquired pneumonia. And thirdly, a corticosteroid domain in which patients will be randomised to hydrocortisone or no hydrocortisone. It's nested within a registry domain so that patients with CAP who for whatever reason aren't eligible for randomisation within the platform still have some limited uh, data collected. And also patients with severe CAP who were eligible for randomisation but who for whatever reason were not enrolled are also collected so that we have the capacity to understand any systematic differences between patients who were eligible and randomised versus those who are eligible and not randomised. And coming in the near future will be a ventilation domain, which uh, includes the options of conventional lung protective uh, ventilation with a target tidal volume of six mils per kilogram, extracorporeal CO2 removal, which is a strategy which allows for very low tidal volume uh, ventilation, a type of ventilation known as airway pressure release ventilation, and a fourth uh, ventilatory strategy in which the positive end expiratory pressure is personalised based on peep responsiveness. And so RemapCap really provides a menu for its sites. Sites choose the domains and interventions that make sense to them. Uh, sites are able to determine uh, their own equipoise, and then the participating sites will influence how the menu changes uh, over time as the trial adapts and considers new domains and new interventions. We start remap cap with one strata, which is to differentiate patients who, are, who have shock or are not shocked at the time of enrolment. But it has been set up so that there's in essence a sleeping strata, which is the presence or absence of suspected or proven pandemic respiratory infection. And so in the event of a pandemic turning up, the intention is to have developed uh, domains uh, uh, of interventions that will be activated uh, in conjunction with the occurrence of a pandemic, and that those domains, wherever possible, would have been subject to all necessary ethical and regulatory uh, approvals um, uh, in advance so that they can be um, activated uh, at short notice. And then analysis occurs by strata 
with borrowing from the other strata to the extent that is statistically uh, appropriate. So, for example, steroids work very differently in pandemic uh, infection. That is capable of being um, uh, extracted from the data. Whereas if steroids work in the same way as they do in interpandemic severe community acquired pneumonia, the data are borrowed from uh, the interpandemic period um, to provide um, a more rapid answer to that particular question in the event of a pandemic. So I don't know what the pandemic domains will be. There'll be a process set up uh, to determine uh, what are the most appropriate uh, pandemic domains. But it's entirely possible that it might be um, an antiviral domain where, for example, patients could be randomised um, to conventional uh, enteral administration of the neuramidase inhibitor versus intravenous um, um, uh, administration. Or as patients uh, recover, um, uh, to randomise patients to uh, administration of convalescent serum or no convalescent serum. So the features that accrue in a pandemic are the capacity to add or subtract domains as required, and we'll seek to have a consensus process to determine the most appropriate pandemic uh, domains for which we'll seek all uh, ethical and regulatory uh, pre-approval. We're obviously able to launch immediately in participating sites once um, uh, those uh, um, aspects are in place. And it would also be much easier to add additional side sites in the event of a pandemic for an already recruiting uh, trial. And the other features which are, um, in my opinion, major advantages in a pandemic is that because of the response adaptive randomization, the best treatments are applied progressively even before there is statistical confidence that they are the best treatment to the extent that the statistical confidence is appropriate. And then ongoing implementation once uh, there is confidence about the most effective results by um, implementation of the superior treatments. And we also don't have to wait for the publication and presentation of results during a pandemic because of, uh, of a, of a pre-specified sample size. We can conclude the questions rapidly um, as soon as there is sufficient statistical confidence um, about a particular result. So Gail, thank you for the opportunity uh, to present this evening. Um, uh, um, in conclusion, what I'd like to indicate is that adaptive trial designs um, allow a design to be changed as specified in the original trial protocol according to the data uh, that has uh, accrued within the trial. There's the prospect that remaps as a design offer very substantial gains uh, in trial efficiency, answering more questions simultaneously and answering questions more quickly. For these reasons, adaptive trials are particularly well suited um, to uh, um, uh, generating evidence during a pandemic. And REMAPCAP is designed to be able to switch from inter-pandemic mode to pandemic mode uh, if required, although it will still be at least several years um, before we're in that uh, situation of um, having the pandemic domains determined um, with appropriate uh, ethical approval. But um, <clears throat> thank you very much for the opportunity um, to speak, and I'd be um, delighted uh, to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Steve. That was an absolutely fantastic presentation about a very interesting uh, topic, and I'm very excited to, to see how this works out over the next few years. We've got uh, about seven or eight minutes um, to go before we close the webinar. Are there any questions from the participants? I can't see any on my screen at the moment, but as you're typing them in, or in day, if people are having problems typing in, perhaps you can see if anyone raises their hands. Steve, if I may ask you, um, if, if someone's interested in learning more about VMAPCAP or indeed at some point um, perhaps becoming a site, would they just email you? I see you've got your email address quite helpfully at the bottom of that slide. Would that be the easiest way to, to, to explore that? 
Uh, yeah, very much so, Gail, and, and delighted um, uh, for anyone who, who does want to um, understand more um, or uh, think about possible uh, participation. Um, the other avenue, of course, is through uh, ISERIC, which um, is um, 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 uh, a strong supporter uh, of, um, of REMAPCAP, and many of the networks involved in REMAPCAP are members of ISERIC, but also through uh, the regional um, uh, pandemic consortia, uh, PREPARE, uh, particularly for European sites, um, a prize um, uh, in Australia, uh, and I suppose also in New Zealand. Um, identified also John Marshall at the Canadian Critical Care Clinical Trials Group um, with respect to any interest from Canada or Derek Angus in the United States. It, it is a high priority um, that we uh, set REMAP cap up in as many locations as possible. And so there are obviously uh, places um, in, in Asia, in uh, South America, uh, in Africa uh, and, and the Middle East where we would be very interested uh, in sites. Um, although what I would say is that we're probably, we have a timeline over the next 12 or 24 months to probably focus on getting the trial up and running um, in, in the initial locations before we would be um, uh, particularly wanting to go to other locations. And that's just because although um, the design features that I talk about um, sound um, attractive or they are attractive um, when presented, um, it's not straightforward for sites, uh, it's not straightforward for ethics committees, it's not straightforward for um, the data management and the determin determination of eligibility, which all needs to occur in near uh, real time. So there are major logistic challenges that we're working through at the moment to try and make sure that we can um, execute this design. Steve, thank you. And uh, my next question is going to be one about the ethical review boards and how you've found or the, the team have found um, their acceptance or their, their questions around it. And, and I suppose if you don't have the answers to, to all of that at the moment because you're, you're still working through some of this, is there a place that people can go to um, on, for example, the internet? Is there, you know, the Prepare Europe website, for example, where um, people can actually go? Um, or do you plan to publish as, as you proceed through this journey? Because I think there will be a lot of um, operational challenges and solutions that, that will be worth sharing with the community. Yes, yeah, so, uh, for example, um, as part of a prize, we're hoping to have um, a PhD student um, who, will, who will seek to evaluate the extent to which we've been successful or unsuccessful um, at achieving embedding of this uh, design. I didn't really go that much into the embedding aspects, but the trial is designed with a web-based interface uh, with the intention being that on a 24-7 basis, uh, junior doctors can log on and uh, answer a series of questions which are no more complex or no more um, uh, burdensome than information that would be expected to be um, uh, routine knowledge for this patient. And that then determines their eligibility for the platform and for domains and for uh, particular interventions within a domain. So, for example, we can't allow the platform to randomise a patient who has had a rash with a penicillin uh, to a penicillin-based uh, uh, beta-lactam, and we can't allow a patient with a history of anaphylaxis to penicillin to be randomised uh, to any of the uh, beta-lactam uh, options. So we're trying to do a lot of work uh, to embed this uh, as a routine process um, and, and that's something that we will seek to publish and present as we go. Obviously, each month, very consultants will do an analysis of the uh, new data and determine new posterior probabilities. We define um, uh, superiority as a 99% probability uh, of superiority. And as soon as any particular intervention in any uh, strata 
hits that target, we would immediately um, uh, present uh, and publish that result in the same way as any other uh, clinical trial. So we would hope uh, to generate multiple papers uh, over the next few years um, as rapidly as questions can be answered. Thank you, Steve. Well, just in conclusion of, of this webinar, it's as, as someone who was also involved with the, the 2009 response and uh, the problems that we faced trying to launch any clinical research in a timely fashion, um, certainly at a personal level, I cannot applaud you all enough and, uh, and indeed wish you all the very best. And uh, I look forward to, to watching what happens with this, in particular over the next two to three years. And, and, and hope that it's, it's an element to response uh, for the next pandemic. So thank you very much, and thank you very much to all of you who've dialed in.